Tito, we are ready when you are. Thank you for joining us again tonight. Please don't think. A priest's heart don't bleed. Every time a little homie strikes three and gets 20, reminds me of me. Back in the day, if I needed to cry, I wouldn't tell you why. And then it happened one day, it was like a drive-by. He tried to take my life away. But my mama in the sky cried, he needs his need for me. Someday he'll do a priest plea on bended knee. So get ready. Like Tupac said, Hail Mary, come with me. You see, back in the day, it was hand to hand, mano a mano, may the best man stand. Nowadays, they don't play, dang, they join a gang and they think it's a game. And they go bang, bang. And they take a life away. With his hand in the glass, the Vato had the nerve to say, Father, will you pray for me? Because homie don't play. Little did he know he's the one being played. He's a victim of the mind that says it's cool to do time. En una manera, tenemos la culpa. La raza unida es una mentira. ¿Dónde están los padres? Niños abandonados. Mi nueva familia, mami, es mi pandilla. I can see it now. No, it's not a prophet. A million homie march, praying on DC. Lift up the arms, not to do harm, but to pray, pray, pray for the family. Amen. I appreciated last week with the uh, discussion of our Blessed Mother. I was going to go 100% into our Blessed Mother tonight. I have to. I have to. But then I realized that you already had a discussion last week of our Blessed Mother, and uh, I kind of pondered that a little bit. And I said, well, I guess it's not meant to be. So I'll talk to our Blessed Mother, but I'm going to kind of go through the back door a little bit here, okay? So bear with me. And uh, I've been blessed to... Um, perform around the country and give a few talks, etc. But as far as I'm concerned, I was called in my mother's womb. So let me be really careful and clear about that. My vocation started from the moment of my conception. That's when the vocation starts. That's when we're called to holiness from the moment of my conception. And most of you know, uh, or some of you might know a little bit about my background in terms of, I grew up in Richmond, California, Northern California, and uh, very blessed with a beautiful family, my parents, uh, not only are together after 66 years, but they're alive after 66 years. So you can imagine what a blessing that is for me. So when I was asked earlier, how am I doing? I said, I'm so blessed, I'm spoiled. There are blessings like that that I'm talking about. I don't deserve this. There are a lot of people who don't have their parents. So I feel blessed. Now, I can't see my parents right now. I can't hug them. And my other seven brothers and sisters can't hug them. And my nephews and nieces and uh, can't hug them, their grandchildren because that's just how it is right now. So these are some of the dynamics that are going on within the church and in society uh, that we need to surrender to. And, uh, but I know they're there and that's a grace for me. So I grew up in Richmond, California and I got caught up like a lot of you guys got caught up and I'm not gonna go over and exaggerate stuff. I'm not gonna down talk it or I'm not gonna up talk it. There's nothing to really, you know, not a whole lot to say. You guys know what's up. You know what it's like to be Chicano, to be Chicana, to grow up in the streets you know, the whole game of hustling. And back in the day in the 60s and the 70s, you know, the Cholo uh, uh, culture and Chicano lowrider culture was big time. So I got caught up in whatever other Rasa got caught up. I didn't know that it was possible to get through teenage years without getting high. I just didn't know it. I didn't know, I thought you had to drink. I thought you had to fight. That's just the environment that I grew up in. It was very powerful, very seductive, it's like a drug. And so uh, I got caught up in that to a certain degree, even though I went to Catholic schools, even though I was baptized as an infant, even though I was confirmed, even though I had a father who came home every day, even though we went to church on Sundays, I was very blessed in my life. But that just goes to show how powerful the devil is and that uh, we need to participate in our own salvation. I didn't quite get that. You know, I guess I was uncatechized. I knew I was baptized. I, 
I had a sense of who God was, etc. But to go deeper in the faith. And that's why I'm so grateful that you guys have this ministry. Let me just break it down real quick. I'm glad you're doing this in English. I'm glad you're doing this in English. I felt like up until about five years ago, there was a huge gap in the church. Somehow we just assumed that Latino evangelization was done in Spanish. And that's cool for a large population of the group of, uh, of the Hispanic community. But there's a great need there, especially young Latino millennials who, for whatever reason, prefer to speak English or can be evangelized in English. And you guys are filling that gap. So I just want to praise God for that, that you're doing this work. And I believe that's the work of the Holy Spirit and our Blessed Mother. So thank you for being there and using your intelligence, et cetera. We have a lot of negative talk about the millennials. And yeah, some of it's justified, but a lot of it isn't. We have some beautiful, young, Latino, English-speaking Catholics out there who are trying to live their faith. So thank you for the work you're doing. So it took me a while to get it. I mean, one thing led to another. I was in jail a couple of times. I had a police record and kicked out of a couple of schools when I was at 19. And that's what that song was about, that little... Uh, 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 poem was about was I lost a portion of my right leg in a street fight when I was 19. So I was out there messing up. I was drunk. I was intoxicated. I was fighting. I was doing the stuff I had done for so long. But you keep playing Russian roulette. If we keep playing Russian roulette, eventually the bullet's going to come out. That's just how it is. So I got easy. And so I went into the hospital and I amputated my right leg. And that was a big thing for me. Um, but you know, the sick part of it, this goes to show how the devil works. I kind of expected that. I didn't have much self-esteem. I didn't really belong in this world. I didn't have much hope. I certainly wasn't thinking of the priesthood. I certainly wasn't thinking that on April 2nd, I would be speaking here online to Sower LA. I certainly, that was not my thinking. I didn't have any hope. I really didn't. And I think if you talk to a lot of people who get jailed and get incarcerated, and they'll tell you, this is pretty much what they expect. That's just how it is. And so that's the sick thinking that was going on in my life when I was 19 years old. And my concern is that's a lot of the thinking that's going on right now with a lot of the younger population. They don't dream, see, they don't dream. And I'm not talking psychology, I'm talking spirituality, to dream, to have hope, to see a better future and to ask yourself an honor que honest question, why were you conceived? Not why were you born, but why were you conceived? And in the end, of course, we're all conceived and called to one particular vocation on a deeper level. Yeah, and that's called to be in love. Let me repeat that. Everybody here is called to the same vocation, to be in love through Mary with Jesus, through Mary with Jesus, through Mary with Jesus. We're all called to the same calling here, right? But which manifested in different ways. So one thing led to another and I came out of the hospital and. Uh, you know, God has his way of humbling us, folks. Now, I was discerning what I was going to be giving up and what I was going to do for Lent. Well, I don't have to discern anymore. Right? I mean, we got humbled. We are humbled. This is what you call being humbled. I don't know if you guys get that or not. That's what this is called. This is called being humbled. What's going on right now with COVID-19? And this is nothing nothing compared to what it can be like. So this is what you call being humble. We're being humbled right now. And I know there's a lot of discussion. Did God cause this? Is he, you know, whatever. And maybe I'll touch upon that in a minute. No, I'm going to touch about it right now. In the last two Sundays readings, we had the reading uh, regarding the blind man. And the question was raised. Was this man, uh, is it his fault his sin that he was born blind, or was it his parents? See, the Pharisees trying to get the head of Jesus. They're trying to manipulate him and trap him. So he said, was it his fault that he was born blind, or was it the sin of his parents? And Jesus' response is very similar to what his response was regarding Lazarus and why he died. He said, no, this man was born blind so that the works of God can be revealed. Notice how that works. Same thing with Lazarus. Jesus says that his death is not going to end in death. It's for the greater glory of God. It's so that God might be glorified. Notice what's happening here. It's not as if God called it. But if we are open to grace, if we're open to our blessed mother, if we're open to the Holy Spirit, regardless of what takes place in life, even the coronavirus, even death itself can be turned into a grace 
and a blessing. But that's only done by the Holy Spirit. So one thing led to another. And I became a Catholic priest and I started working doing this and that. And uh, man, I'm all into, you know, I'd like to think that I think out of the box, but it's not really out of the box. Let's not fool ourselves. Right now, this ain't out of the box, sir. I mean, I hate to pop you guys bubbles. What you're doing is good stuff, but this is nothing compared to what you could be doing. So don't give up. Take it to another level and another level. The Lord has blessed us with so many uh, beautiful resources right now, so many opportunities to evangelize. And I'm upset that the church is so far behind. There's so much good work that we could use and do in the church to save souls. So one thing led to another and I was thinking, I gotta do something, right? And you know, because basically when it comes right down to it, I feel blessed that uh, I'm a Roman Catholic priest. I feel, uh, I feel blessed and a bit upset because I know there are a lot of youth like me who never made it, who lost their faith. And I know what's going on with our people. I know what's going on with our culture. And every year we're losing more and more Catholics to the faith. They do not understand the faith. So when these scandals took place and have been taking place in regards to the priests, the scandals of the priests, et cetera. It's those people who have faith are going to keep on coming back to the sacraments because they know the true priesthood rests in who? True priesthood rests in who? Of Jesus Christ. And he was perfect. And we know those apostles that followed him, even though they chose him, they were weak and they fell. But Jesus Christ stayed true to the cross. And especially right now with the coronavirus going on. And yeah, I must admit, my faith has been challenged too. So I have to keep on going back. And I realize with the help of mama, with the help of my mama, I realize there's a much more dangerous virus out there, folks. Much more contagious. The virus of immorality, the virus of sin. This coronavirus has no power over the soul. Sin might, if we're open to it. But the coronavirus, what can it do? It can harm our bodies, but our bodies have already been redeemed. Our bodies are already owned. The coronavirus doesn't have the final or last word, doesn't even have the first word of who lives and who dies. Jesus Christ decides that. Jesus Christ decides who lives and who dies. Not the coronavirus, not a bullet, not cancer. But we have to be open to the entirety of God. So I started trying to do my work and and I do a few things. I've been around a little bit. And right now, I'm right here. So I'm not going to talk about out there. I'm not going to talk about yesterday. Not even going to talk about tomorrow. I'm only going to talk about what's going on right here, okay? And I want to open your minds up to something that uh, is isn't talked a whole lot about. And I know you know it, but I'm just going to remind you about some basic truths of the faith. We believe not just in God. So be careful with your language of God. Be specific in regards to what you believe. And no, you're not just Christian. You're Roman Catholic Christian. Make sure you own that name. You're Roman Catholic Christian. Don't water down who you are. You're rooted in a particular history with a particular calling, with a particular theology. Not all, quote unquote, Christians believe the same. Roman Catholic Christians come to the Roman Catholic Church and we believe in a Trinitarian God. Let me repeat that. A Trinitarian God, the Father, the Son, and man, we should be shaking when I get to that third person. Tell him, Deacon. Look at the deacon shaking. He knows who I'm gonna talk about. That's right. The deacon's shaking right now. He knows who I'm gonna talk about. That's right. Salu knows who I'm gonna talk about. That's huh? right. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> Fire! Woo. Look at him, boy. He got that fire behind him. I told you that fire is already lighting him up over there. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the anonymous God. Yeah, I heard the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, referred to as the anonymous, not the anonymous God, the forgotten God. The forgotten God. So let me say something here. A weak pneumatology is a weak Mariology. Let me repeat that. A weak pneumatology is a weak Mariology. 
there is no way to understand the role of Mary and the rightful role of Mary in the church without understanding the role of the Holy Spirit. From the moment of Mary's conception, not from the moment when she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was active in Mary's life. There is no way she could have been conceived without sin if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit and grace working in her life. That's why the angel Gabriel said, Hail Mary. And if anybody criticizes you for praying the rosary, tell them I'm quoting scripture. Hail Mary. And it's, it's enough for the angel Gabriel to say, Hail Mary, it's enough for me. So Hail Mary, full of grace. This is before the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. So Mary had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm kind of dovetailing on what was mentioned last week. Because I listened to the talk, it was a beautiful talk on our Blessed Mother. But I want to break it down a little bit for you because I know you guys are brilliant and you got that hunger for the truth. And so I'm breaking something down that's been broken down a long time ago. This is nothing original. I stole all this stuff, folks. See, I used to steal from houses and break in. I was a follower, right? We grabbed things. I'm not telling you what we were grabbing, but we were grabbing things. But now I steal from the Holy Fathers. I steal from the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit. So what I like to do right now is talk about the role of the third person in the Trinity. All right. Third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit is as important in your salvation as Jesus is. And we hear a lot about Jesus. I'm saved by Jesus. Right. I got Jesus. I don't need anybody else. I don't need another intercessor. I got Jesus. Well, they completely dismissed the role, the necessary role, not an optional role, of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me read a little bit for you here. And I'm reading according to the Gospel of St. John. As you know, there are four Gospels. And the one who seems to speak most about the Holy Spirit is the Gospel of St. John. Yeah, he's a little different. It's not one of the synoptic gospels. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, very similar. A lot of details in the life of Jesus. But John just kind of takes things to another level. The eternal word, the eternal logos. And I have a theory. Remember, it was John, St. John, who spent time with our Blessed Mother. It was John who went all the way to Calvary for a reason. He's the only apostle who didn't die for his faith. And my theory is not a theory. I believe it's true that the reason St. John was able to persevere is because he stayed close to Mary underneath the cross. And most of us don't want to go to Calvary. St. Peter didn't. Thomas didn't. The other apostles didn't. And especially Judas didn't. But St. John did. He went to Calvary. And my theory is that it's because he stayed close to our Blessed Mother. Yeah, so this comes from the Gospel of St. John. Now, again, St. John speaks a lot about the third person, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to put Jesus to the side for a moment. If you guys just hear me out, put the Father to the side for a moment. Because St. Paul himself says, without the Holy Spirit. This is St. Paul already. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't even say Jesus is Lord. That's how necessary the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, we don't even know how to pray. This is St. Paul. And even though Jesus already taught his apostles how to pray, St. Paul's not without the Holy Spirit. What he's really saying is we don't know how to pray right without the Holy Spirit. We need grace. We need that intermediary between us and Jesus. Now, let's talk about that word intermediary or advocate. All right. Let's talk about that because in the Greek word is called parakletos. Para as in paraclete. Parakletos. Keep that word in mind, parakletos. This is St. John. And Jesus is speaking. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will pray to the Father and he will give you another counselor. A counselor, this comes from John chapter 14, verse 15. So John 14 and John 15 is loaded with some good discussion on the Holy Spirit. John 14 and John 15 is loaded with some good material on the Holy Spirit. 
if you love me and keep my commandments and I will pray for the father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth who the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells within you. I will not leave you desolate. In other words, I will not leave you with orphans in some translation. Notice our blessed mother. What's a child without a mother? An orphan. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you in a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live and you also live. But that's only done through the Holy Spirit. These things I've spoken to you while I'm with you. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So notice the Holy Spirit brings us to Jesus. He says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit so you can remember me. I want you to keep that in mind in regards to the Holy Spirit, because typically we see the Holy Spirit up there, we have the Father up there, and we have the Son up there. So there are three persons spread above us, three persons, one nature, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What St. Maximilian Colby states, and I borrowed my reading and understanding from him, no, he said we should see it in a linear way. You cannot get to Jesus unless you go to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit so that you might know all truth. Who is all truth? Jesus. So notice the linear dynamic of the understanding of the Trinity. We cannot know the Father unless we go through the Son, which is Jesus. So the Protestants are right. Jesus really is the only intercessor between man and the Father. They're right. But now we have to get to Jesus. That's where they're wrong. They seem to be wrong. And a lot of the Catholics seem to not know as well. Must have the third person in our life, which is the Holy Spirit. And of course, we can extend that and talk about the Holy Spirit working through Catholic priests. We can talk about the Holy Spirit working through the sacraments. We can talk about the Holy Spirit working through the church. We can talk about the Holy Spirit working through sower. But once we understand that Jesus is not the only intercessor, we'll be more comfortable with going to our Blessed Mother. Because eventually, and I'll get to this in a bit, the Holy Spirit overshadows our Blessed Mother overshadows our blessed mother and that's we have many saints ahead of us who have gone before us who have taught us that mary is the distributor of all grace i'll get to that in a minute mary as mediatrix of all grace but let's go back to the holy spirit here we go gospel of saint john i'm still there now i'm in 15 i have yet many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now notice again when protestants start quoting scripture or using scripture, remind them that we also have teachings through the Holy Spirit that comes through the institution of the church. Jesus himself said, you cannot outbear it right now. You guys are too bad. You can't even handle me, much less the Holy Spirit. Let me read you something. Now that I'm on a roll right here, let me read you something from the church fathers, okay? This comes from Gregory Nazianzus. It comes out of the catechism. Beautiful teaching on the Holy Spirit. Very simple book. I don't read it, but it is a simple book. See, it's one of those books that have a lot of content in them. I can only handle a little bit at a time. But if your soul is moved and you have a hunger for truth, I recommend you reading the, the catechism. Not that big of a book. It's heavy, though. You don't need to read it all, kind of like the Bible. You just take a little bit at a time. You can only handle a little bit. Anyway, this is what he says. The Old Testament proclaimed the Father clearly but the son more obscurely. So he's talking about the Trinity here. He's saying the Old Testament only speaks about the father, but the son obscurely. For example, Moses. Moses would a prototype, you might say, or a, a foretaste of who Jesus is going to be. He's an intercessor for the Jewish people. Jesus becomes the intercessor. King David, he kind of pointed us towards Jesus, the one who would be born in the Davidic line, the one who was the true king of the world. So this is what he says. The Old Testament proclaimed the father clearly, but the son more obscurely. The New Testament revealed the son and gave us a glimpse of the divinity of the spirit. So he's saying the father, Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, and he gave us a glimpse of the Holy Spirit. Now the spirit dwells among us and grants us a clearer vision of himself. It was not prudent when the divinity of the Father had not yet been confessed to proclaim the Son openly, and when the divinity of the Son was not yet admitted, to add the Holy Spirit as an extra burden. In other words, folks, you couldn't have, I couldn't have handled it. 
The best we could do is handle the Father in the Old Testament. The best we could do was handle Jesus in the New Testament. And what this great church father is saying, now's the time of the Holy Spirit and for the Holy Spirit to reveal the Holy Spirit's works. By advancing and progressing from glory to glory, the light of the Trinity will shine in ever more brilliant ways. Isn't that beautiful? Notice again, the third person of the Holy Trinity we're talking about. We're not talking about the Father, not talking about Jesus. I'm only talking about the Holy Spirit because of the Holy Spirit's relationship with our Blessed Mother. And we had a discussion of our Blessed Mother last week, right? So stay with me. Stay with me here. So we have a number of readings that talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, I want somebody here to type back, what's the Greek word for the Holy Spirit? I, what, what, what is the Greek word that's used in the Gospel of John, in the writings of John for the Holy Spirit? I mentioned about eight minutes ago. I wanna see if you guys are up on it. Let's see, I said it. I gave you an example. So let's see if anybody knows it. While you're doing that, I'm going to pull up another verse right here. Uh, huh? You guys are going to love this one. Here we go. You guys, someone better know what the Greek word is for the Holy Spirit. And write it back. While you're doing that, I'm going to read from the letter of John. The same author, the Gospel of John, he's writing now. He wrote two other letters. This is the first letter of St. John, chapter 2. Verse one, okay, so one John, two one. Again, we're talking about John here. I'm giving you some insights into the Holy Spirit and the role of Jesus. My little children, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Notice the word advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and he is the expiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. By this, we may sure be that we know him if we can keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, this kind of goes into another topic, which I'll probably refrain from getting into. If we say we know him, but disobey his commandments, that person is a liar. If we say we know Jesus, but disobey his commandments. That person is a liar. Now, we cannot use the word liar today. I'll use it, but it's not correct. People don't like it. They don't want to hear being called a liar. But St. John didn't have any problem calling people a liar. Matter of fact, the word liar is used about four times in the writing of St. John. Jesus himself calls those people who are hypocrites liars. All right. So those who say, I know him, but not keep his commandments is a liar. But if you keep his commandments, then the love of God is perfected in you. So let's go back. I want to know, because I can't see right here on my screen, if anybody got my test question there, what's the word for, uh, um, for, for Holy Spirit? What's the word? Uh-huh. What's the word? Screen? Yeah, I can't see in the comments down here. Does anybody know? You can put the volume on if you want. Anybody know the, pair, the Greek word? All right, folks. I can't see if you know it, so I'm gonna assume that you do know it, and I'm gonna say it again. I wouldn't doubt it if Salu knows. Salu's got a brilliant mind. That's right, Salu. Here goes the word, parakletos. Para, as in paraclete, kletos. Check this out. The same word is used to describe the Holy Spirit, which means advocate, defender, consoler, as is used in Jesus in the letter of St. John that I just wrote. I referred to the word advocate, Jesus as advocate. Therefore, Jesus is not the only intercessor between us and God, the Father. There's another intercessor, and that is the Holy Spirit, which goes back to my logic in trying to get you to see your relationship with the Father as a linear relationship. And maybe I can have Hernan put on those graphics that I had talked to him about earlier. I can't really see the whole screen right now. Let's see here. 
There we go. And what it does is it challenges us to think of our relationship with the Father as a linear relationship that was only through the Holy Spirit that we get through Jesus and through Jesus to the Father. Check out what St. Maximilian Kobe writes. If you can understand this, then you can kind of get into the Mariology of the mystics. Remember what I said before, a weak pneumatology is a weak Mariology. A weak understanding of the Holy Spirit is a weak understanding of Mary. And I would say a weak pneumatology is a weak Mariology is a weak Christology. A weak pneumatology is a weak Mariology is a weak Christology. A weak pneumatology is a weak Mariology is a weak Christology is a weak ecclesiology. A weak pneumatology, a weak Mariology is a weak Christology is a weak ecclesiology. In other words, if we don't understand the Holy Spirit, we're, we're gone, we're dead, we ain't even, I wish we were only dead, we're not dead, we're damned. You understand the difference, right? There is no death in the spiritual realm. There is no death in the spiritual realm. There's either heaven or eternal damnation, there's eternal life, either way. There's either eternal life with Jesus, with the angels, with the saints, with some of our ancestors, with our blessed mother, or there's eternal life with the devil and all his minions and those who have gone before us. So it's important to be open then to the power of the Holy Spirit. Check this out. This is why St. Maximilian and Kobe can write this. And I'm assuming you know something about St. Maximilian and Kobe. You can always Google his life and get a sense of what he was all about. His life is beautiful, beautiful life. Powerful man, he inspired me. He still inspires me. Thank God I got a saint. I don't have that many saints, but the few I got are soldiers. I got a few soldiers. And that's all I really need right now. I, I might need more, but I'm, I'm, I'm content with that. St. Maximilian Colby, conventional Franciscan. See, he wore a black habit. See this habit right here? It's called a habit, a religious habit. With the help of Mama Mary, I try to wear my habit wherever I go. I see this is a great fault of the church. What do you mean new evangelization? Man, we just need to be old school. And allow the spirit to work in the way the spirit wants. Man, we can't even put on our clerics and our religious garb and walk in public. You don't need to be brilliant to save souls. Just do what we're supposed to do. But I'm going to stop there on that point and go back to what I was talking about because uh, that's not the topic at hand. St. Maximilian Kobe eventually gave up his life for another prisoner. He had a great love for our blessed mother, but his love for Mary was nothing compared to Mary's love for him. Nothing compared to Mary's love for him. Your love for Mary, my love for Mary is nothing compared to her love for us. People talk about we ought not adore Mary. She adores you. She adores me. She adores everybody here. Adores you. Loves you does not want you to go through suffering, especially right now that we're going through with the coronavirus. She's on our side. Nuestra Madre, mother of the sick. And so St. Maximilian Kobe has this uh, uh, insight now. It's a heavy insight, folks, but don't invite El Padre de Cito if you don't want to hear some of this stuff. So just to let you know, I guess I'm a heavy dude. I'm a heavy, but I'm not heavy. You know, not that heavy. I think I'm heavy. I'm nothing. I'm just a little neophyte. You know how that is, right? Here we go. I'm just, I told you I'm a thief. I just steal stuff from other people. I steal stuff from the Bible. I steal stuff from the church fathers. I steal stuff from the saints. So I'm still a thief. But I know the right things to steal today. Here we go. St. Maximilian Kobe. Get ready. Man up. You guys ready? Here we go. The soul is regenerated in the water of holy baptism. You got that part. And thus becomes a child of God. Everybody likes that part, right? Child of God. With it, you know, we all like that part. Water, which purifies everything it washes over, is a symbol of the one who purifies every soul that approaches her. Water 
it is a symbol of the Immaculata. For the Immaculata, for him, is, is our Blessed Mother. On the one who is without blemish, upon those who are washed by water, there descends the grace of the Holy Spirit. Notice the relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit. He always goes back to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, here we go, heavy hitter time. This is an L.A. Dodger ball, folks. This is San Francisco Giants ball. Hey, woo! <laughs> I hope Jose Alvarez ain't on here. Hey, Christian, you, I know you heard that a little, homie. Woo, this is an L.A. Dodger ball. This is giant ball. Here we go. Just kidding, just kidding. All good. I'm not of this world. All right, here we go. Here we go. Get ready. The Holy Spirit, the divine spouse of the Immaculata, the Holy Spirit, the divine spouse of the Immaculata, acts solely in her and through her. That's heavy. He just, let me repeat that. The Holy Spirit, the divine spouse of the Immaculata, acts solely in her and through her, communicates supernatural life, the life of grace. He just said the Holy Spirit only works through our Blessed Mother. That's what he just said. He just wrote that. And this is like one, in, one of 20 examples that I could give you of his writing. But he's not the only one who said this. Many popes have said this. St. Francis knew this. St. Bonaventure writes about this. St. Louis de Montfort wrote about this. But as far as I'm concerned, St. Maximilian Kobe outdoes these other folks. He's a little bit more direct. Now, communication, supernatural life, the life of grace, divine life, the partaking of the love of God, of the divinity. Now, let me read something for you. Stay with me. I don't even know how much time I have right here. Hold on. Because I know heaven sound was going to come on. And uh, so maybe you can let me know how much time do I still got. You're good on timing, Father. About another 10 minutes? About another 10, 15 minutes. All right. Let me take, let me drink some of that water then. I guess in that Holy Spirit in my life, some of that Immaculata. I wish I could check out some of your comments, but I can't really see them. So I know who's on here. Let's see here. Oh, maybe it's because it got a dead battery. Every time my battery goes dead, I think of my soul. I said, man, I need to recharge that soul. Regeneration that St. Maximilian Kobe talks about. Holy Spirit, our Blessed Mother. St. Maximilian Colby said, all grace comes through our Blessed Mother, all grace. And Mary freely decides upon whom to shower this grace. Again, because of her relationship with the Holy Spirit, Mary freely decides who to give this grace to. But remember what I said, a weak Mary, a weak pneumatology is a weak Maryology. And I took it to a couple of other levels, but I'll just stay right there. A weak pneumatology is a weak Mary. So pneuma, breath, pneuma, breath. Jesus breathed upon the Holy, the, the, the apostles, the Holy Spirit, right? Weak pneumatology is a weak Maryology. So let's go back to the pneuma. Let's go back to the Holy Spirit. This comes from St. Paul's writings to the Corinthians. St. Paul writes a lot of beautiful things about the Holy Spirit. Here he is talking about the Holy Spirit. Comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. A lot of this you're familiar with, but stay with me. 1 Corinthians 12. St. Paul writes a lot about the Holy Spirit. Remember, the four Gospels were written. 
St. Paul comes along, great missionary, begins to write all these letters to these different communities, to Rome, to Corinth, to Philippi, to different communities he's writing. And he's talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He's the one who says, without the Holy Spirit, we can't even say Jesus is Lord. That without the Holy Spirit, we don't know how to pray. He's big on the Holy Spirit because he knows he would be damned without the Holy Spirit. He was a sinner. He was broken. Very important in the spiritual life. Not just believing in God, but it's also not believing in ourselves. Let me repeat that. It's not just believing in God, but it's not believing in ourselves. Somehow we have to be humble. We got to do what we can to be humble. And apparently we haven't been doing a good job, which is why what has taken place has taken place. We're being humble. From ashes you came to ashes you shall return. We seem to have forgotten that. And all these people complaining about how I don't have access to the Eucharist. They start quoting canon law. We got a right to the Eucharist. No, you don't. I don't care what canon law says. Let's get behind the spiritual message of what canon law is supposed to be about. Canon law is supposed to be about the direction of your soul. Jesus is not a right. Eucharist is not a right. Heaven is not a right. It's a blessing, a grace, a privilege. Sacraments are not rights. Going to confession is not a right. We need to be humble. It's a gift. The Blessed Sacrament is a gift. And hopefully now we can kind of ponder that, get in touch with that, and us priests too, because my theory, my theory is that us priests are being humbled as well. And we're offering the sacrifice of the Mass by ourselves. We always offer it to the community, but the letter of Hebrew, like I said, we offer the sacrifice for our sins and the sins of the church. Well, we better offer it for our sins because we have failed the church. We have failed Jesus. We have failed the mother of God. It's the time for everybody to repent and to recognize the great gift that we have in front of us with all the liturgical abuses, with the lack of reverence in our liturgies and in our masses with the lack of time that we have taken to show devotion to the blessed sacrament. And now everybody wants to go to church. Everybody's clamoring. Everybody's upset because they can't go to church. Where were you before? If everybody wants to adore the blessed sacrament, and I'm not talking about the cream of the crop. I know there are some of you out there who have been faithful. You have been faithful. But as a whole, we have not been faithful. We have been unfaithful to the Lord. We're like Gomer, the wife of Hosea, who was unfaithful to him, who went out with another man. She was unfaithful. We have been unfaithful to the Lord. Yet we know, and this is the good news, if we go back to our Blessed Mother, if we get humble and call upon our Blessed Mother, I would love to see, and I'm not judging, I'm just telling you what I would love to see. Every Catholic pull out that rosary every day and pray the rosary. New legislation isn't going to do it. Face masks are not going to do it. A vaccine is not going to do it. Brilliant political figures is not going to do it. Another president is not going to do it. Another pope is not going to do it. Another priest is not going to do it. Only grace will do it, folks. We need to realize how vulnerable we are that we're absolutely nothing without grace. This is just a taste of what can happen. Now, let me share something with you. Um, good news, even though you probably already know it, but just to remind you, all right? Just to remind you, the church knows that we can fall into situations like this. The church is not naive. Let me read something from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, all right? Catechism, it's, I, don't like, I don't like picking it up. It's a heavy book. Look how small it is. It's a heavy book. Because I don't always want to hear the truth too. And I'd rather, you know, I got a shallow mind. Got a shallow mind. I got a lazy mind. I know that. Uh, so I'll admit it. But every once in a while, I'll pick it up. 
This is what the catechism says, 1452, regarding the confession of sins, because I know this is radical on the part of the church right now to not allow, at least in the Archdiocese of LA, I'm in the Archdiocese of LA. I work in a dial of diocese, but also work in the Archdiocese of LA. So I have a sense of what's going on. And priests right now, unless it's an extreme emergency, we are not able to offer the sacrament of confession. This was a very difficult, painful decision on the part of our archbishop. My sense is, I don't know exactly all the details, not claiming I know all the details, but he's not only concerned about the rest of the church, he's also concerned about the priests as well, about the livelihood of the priests. So it's a difficult decision. We know that 67, 68 priests have already died in Italy, 14 times the number of Italian laity priests, 14 times the number of other Italians have died from the coronavirus for whatever reason, some of it age, some of it because of their work. And so we're just asking the church to take a little break. So I agree with the archbishop, very painful, painful, painful decision. But let me remind you of the teachings of the church that's always been there. Here we go, 1452 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Here we go, listen to me. When it arises from a love of God, when it arises from a love by which God is loved above all else, contrition is called perfect, contrition of charity. Such contrition remits venial sin. It also obtains forgiveness of mortal sins if it includes the firm resolution to have recourse to the sacramental confession as soon as possible. Are you hearing that? Regards to the sacrament of confession, contrition, a repentant, contrite heart begins before you even get there. To a certain degree, you're already forgiven. That's what it's saying. As long as you have the desire to go to confession as soon as you are able, that's the beauty of this sacrament. Now, we can apply this also to the sacrament of Eucharist because I know what's going on here as well. And I'll get back to what I was talking about the Holy Spirit in a minute, but I believe you need to hear this. The sacrament of the Eucharist also. This is what St. John Paul II writes on the Eucharist. It's called Ecclesia Dei Eucharistia. Ecclesia Dei Eucharistia, a beautiful apostolic exhortion from St. John Paul II. I talked about confession. You get the concept there, right? As long as you have a willing spirit and you're truly sorry for what you have done, you're already experiencing the grace of mercy. Now, when you have a chance, you can go to confession, but lighten up, lighten up. The mercy of our blessed mother is there. She knows your intentions. She's your mama. She's your mother. So let's talk about the Eucharist. We can apply the same principle. St. John Paul II, the celebration of the Eucharist, however, cannot be the starting point for a communion. Let me repeat that because I know you guys are deep. You're deep thinkers. You're philosophers. You know what's going on here. You've got critical thinking skills. So hear me out. Here we go. The celebration of the Eucharist, however, cannot be the starting point for a communion. In other words, when you receive the body and blood of our Lord, when you open your mouths up, when you put your hands out, when you receive the body and blood of our Lord, when you receive communion, that's not the starting point of communion. It can't be. If you think that that communion that you receive is the beginning and ending of your relationship with God, you're losing your soul and you do not understand what it means to be in communion with the Lord. And this is what he goes on to say. A communion which it seeks to consolidate and bring to perfection. The sacrament is an expression of this bond of communion, both in its invisible dimension. In other words, that communion that you have right now with God needs to be worked on. You can have communion with God right now, but the receiving of the Eucharist is the perfection of that communion. You got that? I simply put that out because I know we're going through difficult times right now in the church, spiritually speaking. But I'm letting you know, Mama Mary is right there with you and she will work through this. And in the same way that that blind man's weakness and frailties and what seemed to be a negative was turned into a moment of grace. In the same way that Lazarus who was dead, how many days was he dead? Four days, he was gone, forget it. Lazarus was dead, he was out, out for the count. And Jesus comes back, he says, this death 
will result in the glorification of God. This virus, this coronavirus will result in the glorification of God as long as we are open to it. As long as we're open to the grace of our Blessed Mother. Yeah. So keep that in mind, folks, in terms of what's going on right now in the Roman Catholic Church and your own spiritual lives, etc. OK, be open to the Virgin Mary working in your life. Now, let me read you something. This comes from First Corinthians, verse 11. Here we go. St. Paul. Remember earlier I talked about St. John. Now I'm talking about St. Paul. Here we go. He talks about the Holy Spirit. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were heathen, you were led astray with dumb idols, however you have been moved. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one is speaking by the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Notice how much emphasis he puts on the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, and everybody's heard this. You like this. It sounds great. But the same, so many gifts, same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, varieties of service. And there are varieties of working, but the same God, et cetera, et cetera. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same, only one spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, et cetera, et cetera, and various Gifts speaking in tongues to another, the interpretation of tongues. So we know the Holy Spirit is going to work in marvelous ways, in different ways in your life. So be open to that grace. Now, listen to this. And this is where he concludes. All these are inspired by one and the same spirit, which you got. You got that. Who apportions to each one individually. Hear me out. As he will. Not as Jesus wills, not as the Father wills. The Holy Spirit enjoys autonomy. The Holy Spirit di distributes grace according to how the Holy Spirit will. We cannot say the will of Jesus is forced upon the will of the Holy Spirit. The will of the Father is forced upon the will of Jesus. Doesn't work like that. It wouldn't be three persons. What defines a person is freedom of will. The Holy Spirit is a person, not just a spiritual being. St. Maximilian Kobe says, if you want to adore the Holy Spirit, revere our Blessed Mother. The Holy Spirit is a person, needs to be adored. So the Holy Spirit, according to the scripture, distributes grace according to how the Holy Spirit wants. Now, attach our Blessed Mother then with the Holy Spirit. Notice what St. Maximilian Kobe said earlier that our Blessed Mother distributes graces upon who she wills, yeah? Why? Because of her relationship with the Holy Spirit. And if you understand that, you will see that Mary does not replace Jesus. Mary does not replace Jesus. The whole focus of the Holy Spirit, and I've read that to you earlier, the focus of our Blessed Mother, the whole mission of our Blessed Mother and the Holy Spirit is to bring us to who? Everybody should know that answer right now. Everybody should type that answer in right now. You better type it in. Our Blessed Mother and the Holy Spirit, their mission is to bring us to who? You better type it in right now. I'm going to wait. That's right, to Jesus. I hope you did not say the Father. I hope you did not say God. Remember, we're Trinitarian, folks. Trinitarian. Give the Trinity some love. Don't be afraid to say I'm Trinitarian. That's right. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one nature. Boom. Trinitarian. Know who the Father is and what his role is. Know who the Son is and what his role is. Know the role of the Holy Spirit. I'm Trinitarian. That's right. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot know Jesus. Without Jesus, we cannot know the Father. I'm Trinitarian. 
and our blessed mother. Jesus himself said, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed our blessed mother, I mean, scripture says, Holy Spirit overshadowed our blessed mother. Jesus, when referring to what a marriage is, Jesus, when referring to what a marriage is between a man and a woman, oftentimes out here, those trying to promote homosexual behavior. Well, Jesus never condemned homosexual behavior in the Bible. There's a lot of things Jesus did not condemn in the Bible because it was so obvious, folks. He didn't condemn incense either. He didn't condemn a lot of sins. Jesus defines marriage. Doesn't need to be defined it again. It's been defined when a man leaves his parents, when a young woman leaves her parents, the two shall become, boom, one, one. The sacrament of marriage represents our relationship with Jesus Christ, loves us in good times and bad. When a sin, think about it, when a sinful man comes together with a sinful woman through grace, the two shall become one, one. It's beautiful. If that's true for a sinful man and a sinful woman, how much more true is it for the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit. The third person, how much more true is it for the Holy Spirit and her who is described in Bible, Bible as full of grace? Imagine how close that relationship is between the Holy Spirit and our Blessed Mother. Holy Spirit overshadowed her. Jesus gave us his mother for a reason at the foot of the cross. So we need to look up to adore God, but also look down to recognize our wrongs. I'm going to finish with one story right here, all right? Here we go, folks. I'm going to finish with a story. It's helped me a lot, especially now that we're going through Lent, especially now that we're being humbled. We're being humbled, folks. Woo! We're being humbled. Man, we got all these lightweights out here, man. I like my brother's a creator of the homies, right? And he wrote this beautiful little uh, uh, meme out there. And he got these people all locked up for years. And here we are complaining. You know, some of these bottles already done time in their little cells. And now they're all upset, whatever. Man, we're lightweights. We're so used to our freedom. Anyway, we're being humbled right now. But this story has helped me quite a bit. It goes like this. It comes from St. Catherine of Emmerich beautiful saint, a mystic in the church. Here it goes. Had Judas, who took his own life, who was so full of sin, and we know what he did. The truth of the matter is, we are Judas. I am Judas. I am Judas. And we need to think about that during this Holy Week, when we're reading the Bible, reading scripture on Palm Sunday, we're going over the Passion. You know, we have that Peter within us. We have that Thomas. We have that Judas within us. We have the crowd within us. Anyway, had Judas on his way to committing suicide, ran into our blessed mother. This comes from St. Catherine of Emmer. I told you I still, I still, still, I still from the saints, from the Bible. Had he ran into our blessed mother on his way to committing suicide because of his guilt, his shame, he couldn't deal with it. Peter dealt with it. Judas couldn't. Had he ran into our blessed mother, she would have embraced him, hugged him forgiven him and turned him back to Jesus. Go back, Judas. He's dying for you. Go back. And to a certain degree right now with all that's going on, my senses, that's what our blessed mother wants us to do. She wants us to be humbled right now. She wants us to go back to her son. If anything to do it spiritually right now, to be humbled. And as soon as we have a chance, to run to that sacrament of confession, to run to the body and blood of our Lord. I want you guys banging on that door. As soon as they open that door, folks, we're going to bang. I'm out. Ave Maria. In that same spirit and fire of the Holy Spirit and our blessed Mother Mary, um, let us go ahead into prayer now and we'll have heaven sound uh lead us in um a song for prayer so take it away heaven sound
Presence.